Hey, hey, scrappy ladies, how are you? My huge apologies, huge apologies for being late, an hour late. Now, I'm going to check on my phone here real quick. I just want to make sure that I am live, and I'm going to give it a second for you all to find me because of the delay. Hey, Catherine, how are you? I'm just checking on my phone, making sure I'm live. Give me a thumbs up, Catherine, if you can hear me. Give me a thumbs up while I'm checking, checking, checking. I just want to make sure that I am live. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, they didn't bite him, Catherine, but the story goes on. Hey, Cindy, how are you? I am just checking here. All right. I am live. Okay. Now I just want to make sure that I'm muted. Okay. Awesome. Oh my gosh. So you ladies know me. Oh, sorry. I just hit my table too. Okay, I am on time. Like, it makes me crazy to not be on time. And these delivery people were late. And not only were they late, they tried to deliver a broken piece. And so I had to have words. I had to have words with, not with the little, not with the guys who were delivering. It's like, not their fault, but with the manager. And then she's like, I'm like, just cancel the order. Seriously, like, because it was a big order. It's like, not, it was a big order. I ordered a new bed like a big fancy bed, right? I was kind of splurging. And she's like, well, we can have somebody come fix it. I'm like, uh, no, I am not taking delivery of something that's broken, people. No, no, cancel the order. So anyhow, whoo, ah, finding my Zen place. So I apologize for being an hour late. I'm just coming back to these Facebook Live series and the first one out, I'm an hour late. So, eh crazy. It's going to make me crazy. I'm going to have to start day drinking or something. So, hey, Maureen, how are you? Hey, Miss Katie, how are you doing? Oh, good. Maureen says she can hear me loud and clear. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, ladies, thank you so much for waiting for me and finding me here an hour late. I sent an email. I posted in the group, etc. But anyhow, tonight we are talking about finding your like right business idea in all the right places. And even if you already have a business, I think that this is a, a super powerful topic for a couple reasons. One, we should always be refining our business ideas. And number two, I think we can always be thinking about how we can add to our businesses. And I am, I'm sorry, I'm moving this way a little bit. Okay, because you, okay, if you ladies know you've been with me for a while, if I sit just like this, what does my banner say? That's right. My banner says the crappy frontier, which is not good. It's not a good marketing move. So I got to sit this way a little bit. Okay. Got to make sure you can see the S. Okay. We're talking about business ideas and where to find them because it's one, it's like the number one question I get. It's one of the number one questions I get. So before I get started, since a lot of you are joining, where are you all joining from? And I know I had an email from somebody who said they, and she's not here yet. So let me just double check. Let me just double check. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go, hang on. Bear with me, ladies. I am copying this link address. I'm going into the group and I'm going to say live now on the page. So hang on, hang on, bear with me, ladies. Live now on the Facebook page. And here's the link, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Because somebody had said that they were they were glad that I was late because they were like snowed in. And I'm like, keep your snow where you are. That's why I live in Florida. <laughs> hey, Sabrina, how are you? You're able to join me, Sabrina, because I'm an hour late and you missed that whole drama. But we're moving forward. We're moving forward. So where is everybody joining from? Uh, oh, Sabrina's on coffee break. Good for you. Okay, good for you. Where is everybody joining from? I have a little bit of a delay, so if I don't answer right away, but I just want to make sure everybody has been able to join. And I had a delivery drama. Delivery, for those of you joining me late, I had, anyhow, the drama's not over, but we're moving forward. We are talking about business ideas because it is so incredibly important to find the right business idea. And a lot of people ask me, like, how do I even find business ideas? And so that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. And so I've come up with five places to start looking for business ideas, right? And I'm just going to keep looking over here. Uh, hey, Vicki. 
Yes, you are on the Scrappy Frontier business page. You are in the right place. Catherine, you're coming in from Arkansas. Awesome. Cindy Ann from, is it Chilliwack, British Columbia? That sounds like a fun town, Chilliwack. Sounds like a very fun town. All right, so let's talk about ideas, business ideas. So uh, first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Colleen Kohanek, and I'm the founder of the Scrappy Frontier, where I help women 50 plus start their first business doing something they love. That's what I do. So, and that's why you're here. So I'm thrilled you're here uh, for the, cause we have a lot of new folks actually joining. Um, Anna Marie says, so glad I didn't miss this here from Lotus, California. Yes. And Maureen as well from Virginia. You didn't miss it cause I'm late and I would, I, I'm usually not late. Like I, I, I tell people I was a hall, mo I was the hall monitor in third grade. So I could wear like that little yellow vest and I like nailed kids for like unauthorized bathroom breaks. Cause I, I like rules. I like rules. I like to be on time, but I just, it didn't happen tonight. It didn't happen tonight. So, Hey Tara, how are you? So business ideas. I've come up with five places to look for business ideas. Now the first one I want to talk about is, well, first let me say this. The right business idea is really important for obvious reasons because it's the right business idea, but it can really make or break uh, one, you like loving your business and potent or potentially hating it in a few years. And it really is going to make or break whether or not you're going to make money with it. Because I got to tell you, if you go with the wrong business idea and you're not loving what you're doing, you know, entrepreneurship is hard. So when you get to those hard days and you don't like your idea, it's going to, they're going to be even stinkier. So <laughs> that's why you want the right idea. Hey, Paula, how are you? So, but I get this question a lot. Like where do you find the right business idea? Where do you come up with the right business idea? So can anybody guess? Give me a guess. Let's do let, Let's just play a little game here. Give me a guess where you think you can find really great business ideas. While I take a sip and there is no alcohol in here, although there will be after this Facebook live <laughs> after the afternoon I just had. Where do you think you can find really great business ideas? I'm just curious what you come up with. And I'm going to keep, there's a delay between when you type and So I want you to comment below and tell me, Hey, Mubaraka, where you think you can find great business ideas. And I'm going to start with number one. So you can't use that one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ruth Adams says Google. Cindy Ann says Pinterest. Yeah, these are good places to search for business ideas. So good, good. Those are some good answers. All right. Catherine says your hobbies. Cindy Ann says Facebook. Yeah. You ladies are stealing my thunder here. You ladies are stealing my thunder. Yes, those are all correct answers. But here's how what I came up with. The most obvious place to find a really great business idea, and this is going to be like a big duh, Colleen, is looking at something you've already done or you currently do for work, right? I mean, that's kind of the big duh. Because So let's say you're an accountant or a bookkeeper and now you want to basically take those skills and do them on your own as your own business, right? So that's, that's a super obvious. That's something you've already done, et cetera. Diantha says you can ask your friends. Yvelda says scrappy group. Absolutely. I like that answer. Uh, Sabrina, what, what I know how to do. Absolutely. And that's Sabrina is kind of what I'm talking about is, so the most obvious place to look for business ideas is something we've already done or are doing. So like if you were, a, you're an accountant or bookkeeper, but you want to make that your own business, you can obviously, you know, take those skills and make your own business, right? Maybe you're an admin of some sorts. And I'm looking at my notes here, ladies, if you see me looking down, because no, I can't memorize this stuff. But I, and I have to have talking points and notes. Otherwise, I go off on these tangents and we wind up in like Nairobi. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Maybe you've like traveled your whole life or you've worked in travel and now you want to like have your own independent travel agency or you want to start a travel blog, right? So you get, so it's something you've already done and it's a continuation of that or kind of an offshoot of that. And starting with that is super obvious and it's super practical. But, but, and this is the big but that I want to talk about because I see it a lot. I see it a lot. And Kate says, look in yourself. Yes, absolutely. Hey, Catherine. 
Sabrina says, what you love to do. Absolutely. So here is the caveat for choosing a business idea based on something you've that you already do that is a profession or whatever it is. Uh, it comes with a big warning. It comes with a really big warning if you choose that path. Is it too obvious or is it too practical? So doing something you already love or that you already do is a great choice if you love that and you really want to continue with it. However, the big caveat is choosing it specifically because it feels like the safe or practical thing to do. No. No, 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 <laughs> don't do that. So like, let's just say uh, I, I worked, uh, I'm just going to say, as a, I worked for a travel agent and I love traveling and now I want to do it on my own, but I'm, so it's practical. I have the experience. I know how to do it, you know, yada, yada, yada. I know how to do it. I've done it a long time. But the other side of me is like, God, I've done that for like 25 years kind of bored with it. I'm really burned out, but it would, it would be my easiest path. No, no, I'm saying no. So if, if the obvious choice, something you've already done is something you absolutely love to do and you're excited about taking it out and doing it on your own, then by all means run with it because it is an easy path. You already have the experience, so there's going to be far fewer, you know, challenges and hiccups for you. But if you're choosing that just because it's practical or seems like the easiest thing to do, no, no, because if you're bored with it now, you're going to hate its guts when you start your own business and you start finding the challenges of having your own business. And it's not the, you know, it's not an idea that's really giving you a lot of joy. So. If it's practical and you love it, run with that business idea. If it's practical and you don't love it, kick it to the curb. Seriously, really kick it to the curb because just because it's practical doesn't mean it's going to be a great choice. Entrepreneurship is hard. It's definitely worth it. No doubt. It is worth it, worth it, but it's hard. And so if you are not loving your idea, like really loving it, I, I need you to kick it to the curb and find something that you're going to love. So, hey, Remy. Hey, Cora. How are you? Hey, Beverly. Oh, lots of ladies joining. I apologize. There's like a delay here. I keep saying that. Um, and I was traumatized by a delivery earlier, so I'm a little flustered as well. So entrepreneurship takes too much emotional energy and learning curves and everything. So in my opinion, you know, we're 50 plus here. If you're going to jump into entrepreneurship, it damn well better be something you're really excited about and you love and you're, you know, ex just really thrilled to be doing it. You're kind of giddy about it. But just picking something because you've always done it, you know, if, you know, don't just pick the practical path because it's not, it's not going to get you far. It's not going to carry you on those hard days, I promise. So, hey, Mary. Uh, all right. So again, if you love what you've already done and it's practical and you think you'll love it, go for it. If not, kick it to the curb because it'll be, it'll just, it'll drag you down. It'll become pure drudgery for you. So, all right. Are you still with me, ladies? You're still with me. Okay. So that was number one, super duper obvious, right? What you've already done, what you're doing now, you turn that into your own business. So, and it's, it, it can definitely work if you love it and you love it so much that you want to take it out and make it your own business and not, you know, working for somebody else, then do that. Okay. All right. So you're still with me here. All right, ladies. Number two, let's see. Uh, Beverly says, I've chosen my creative side, not what I would, not what I've been doing all my life. I want to be passionate about what I am doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that kind of, that's, I'm going to talk a lot about that on number three. <laughs> on number three, I have five of these. Actually, I have six. I have five plus a bonus because I kept thinking of more stuff. But anyhow, so five of these. But yes, Beverly, I think I think a lot of us have this creative side that, you know, we had as little kids and then, you know, you grow up and life happens, you know, shit happens and we get going in our lives and we raise kids and, you know, work or whatever. And a lot of times that creative side kind of, it, it, it takes a back seat somewhere along the way. So when we're starting a business now at 50 and beyond, we have this great opportunity to kind of bring that creativity back to life. So I love that answer. I love that. All right. 
Number two, and this one is still kind of obvious. So I'm, I'm getting the boring ones out of the way first. Okay. So this one is still obvious <laughs> and it's very similar to number one, but what are you trained to do? What are you trained to do? So I separated this out because a lot of us are trained to do things that we haven't necessarily worked in or like made a living doing or, or whatever. So I kind of think of it like a college degree, like, you may have a college degree, say, in art history, but then you worked as an admin or something like that. You know what I'm saying? So there are a lot of things that we're trained in, but we haven't necessarily worked in or made a business out of, right? And so we can't forget these certifications, even if they took place a little while ago. I think they're worth looking at because we took the time to study it or get certified in it or do the training or whatever it was for a reason because we enjoyed it or we had an interest in it somehow, right? So let's look at the certifications or like continuing education. I'm just looking at maybe a college degree, certifications, training, continuing ed. All right, let me look here. So for example, like do you have special experience in something? again, that you maybe not have made a living out of yet, but is there, you have that like skill, skills in your basket of skills that you could draw on. Um, so something to think about. Let's see here. Beverly says, oh, hang on. You built it. Yes, Beverly. I want to hand make ideas and start with. Absolutely. Kate says, shared. Thanks. Good. All right. Hey, Anne from Ontario, Canada. Nice to see you. So it could be, for example, you're trained in a special area. And some of the ideas I came up with, because... I don't, I'm, I'm really bad at coming up with like analogies and like examples, but here we go. Like maybe you're a certified yoga instructor. I know a couple of you in here, but maybe you haven't made a business out of that, but you went through that training and that's a lot. That's like several hundred hours to do that kind of thing. So maybe you have that kind of training or maybe you graduated with a degree in graphic design, but then, you know, life happens and then you wound up working in the family furniture business or something like that. So you haven't been working in graphic design, but you obviously had the interest in it and you have the training in it, in it that you could um, somehow kind of bring that back. So we started with the obvious, something you've already done or are already doing. Number two is something that you're already like specially trained in that you could draw upon to turn into a business. Okay, so those are the first two. So let me let me ask. This is kind of a fun question. Do and I, I maybe I should ask it the opposite way. Do any of you work in the thing that you're trained in? And I think it happens like if you study to be an accountant, you're likely to be an accountant. Or if you study to be like a doctor, you're likely to be a doctor because it was a hell of a lot of years. But a lot of us, I think. We, you know, we may have studied things in the past, you know, whether in high school or, you know, college or, you know, special training somewhere that we don't necessarily work in. Like I know a lot of people with English degrees and it's really hard to get a job. You're like an English teacher basically is kind of the only job unless you, anyhow, you know what I'm saying. So how many of you, do any of you work in the exact thing that you were trained to do? I'm curious. I'm curious. Let's see here. Uh, Diantha says, how do you know what you're passionate about? Because I find uh, I'm not as emotional about things as I used to be. So passionate is it as exciting as it used to be. Diantha, I think that's a really good point. Um, I'm going to come back to that one when I, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to make a note and come back to that. Cause I think when I talk about one of these topics, um, I'm writing it down. And uh, Diantha, I think that's a really great point because things do change. Things that we were interested in 20 years ago, we may not be interested in now, right? So I think I'm going to come back to that point, though. I love it. Uh, let's see here. Hey, Deb, how are you? Uh, Uvelda says, I just graduated with a BA degree in business and I work as an office assistant. So you are working in what you're training in, basically. I mean, business. Uh, you bring business skills in and you'll definitely use your business skills in entrepreneurship. Totally, <laughs> totally, totally. Let's see. Uh, Anne says, yes, counseling, facilitating mental health. Oh, OK. So you're working in it. Um, Beverly says, yes, the food industry. Hey, Lynn, how are you? Uh, 
Anna Marie says, I had a private practice massage studio for more than 25 years, now starting over with something new. Okay, so you studied that, you did it, and now you're looking for something new. Deb says, changed over the years, yes. Uh, Cindy Ann says, I've never been trained in, in anything really, just love making everything natural for family and friends. I've been doing it for years. And the one argument I would push back on, Cindy Ann, is you may not have had like formal training and <laughs> something like to go get like a paper certificate. But I'm of the belief we don't get to 50 and beyond without a shit ton of training <laughs> in life experience, uh, etc. So when you say making everything natural for family and friends, you have obviously self taught a lot of those skills. So you are trained in those things. Uh, human resource manager, Kathy says, yuck. Yeah, Kathy, I'm just going to say because I was laid off at 48, I'm going to say poo poo to HR managers, but I don't want to just stereotype them because I know they're friendly people too. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Anne says, finally getting the degree this May. Good for you. Uh, Sabrina says, travel consultant, diploma from college, worked in airline business for 38 years. So you all are kind of making a liar out of me. So a lot of you are actually working in things that you trained for. I, I trained in uh, international business and applied linguistics, and I actually worked in those things as well. So Diantha says, I studied to be a teacher, now a part-time teacher's aide. Okay, so you all just made a nice liar out of me. Okay, so there are people out there, <laughs> I'm just saying, that have had training and they haven't worked in it, but you all, it looks like you have, but you can draw from that. So uh, let's say that you're trained in something that you haven't worked in you can draw from that experience, okay? Not the people on this Facebook Live because they've actually all worked in what they are trained to do, right? Okay, so uh, Catherine says biotechnology. Cindy, that's right, I haven't killed anyone yet. No, Cindy Ann, you have it. And I just, uh, don't get me, uh, don't even get me on the, like the education thing because I worked in it for 25 years. So anyhow, uh, and says, got stuck on feeling like I needed the letters. I think there's that's a societal thing that we all have felt, um, that you're working in something maybe a long time, but then you need the piece of paper to back it up somehow. Uh, kind of like getting married. Like hopefully you're committed in the relationship before, but that piece of paper kind of solidifies it, right? <laughs> it kind of solidifies that marriage thing. So anyhow, so number one, something you've always done, it's practical, you can kind of seamlessly move into it, but only if you love it. Number two, something you're trained in that you may not have worked in yet, you could draw upon. Again, not this group because you're all trained and working in what you're trained in. So anyhow, you just, yeah, that's kind of funny. But you could certainly do that. I've seen a lot of people that, you know, life happens. Like you go, you get this degree and suddenly you're hired for something else and your whole career takes a different tra trajectory and you really don't work in um, the thing you were trained to do. So you can go back and revisit that because it was an interest or passion. All right. Now let me get a drink of water here. All right. Number three. And this kind of goes back um, to, was it Diantha or Cindy that I said I was going to come back to? This is how bad my memory is. I'm going to look here. I'm going to look here. I'm going to look here. I think it was Diantha. Okay. Anyhow, number three is your childhood and youth. Okay. What are things that you did in your much younger years as a child or a young person that you love to do that has kind of, you know, they've, just they've you've stopped doing them you put them aside you know life you know has taken over and they were put on the back burner is there anything from that time and not necessarily that you could do as a business but how could you bring those things into your business and so what i talked about for example like maybe as a kid you loved acting or performing maybe you loved like building things or maybe you loved camping now I'm not saying you can make a living out of camping. I guess you could, but you know what I mean? I'm not saying that what, you know, you could like specifically turn these things into a business, but what I would love for you to do is figure out what those things were and what it is you loved about those things and how can you bring bits and pieces of those into your business, into your business. So for example, um, 
I, as a kid, I loved uh, acting and I was in this little theater troupe. I mean, I was like seven or eight years old. Like we're talking little kid. We're not even talking like high school plays. I wasn't that good, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Let's see. Catherine says horses. Yes. Yes. Oh, and Diantha, it was you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Yavelda says, I don't want to do what I'm trained in as far as office work. I want to get into retail and mostly want to make my own handmade sewing and crafts that uh, that my grandmother and mother taught me. And I've never had time to do this having full-time work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Catherine says, testing camping tools and blogging on camping sites. Yeah. So, okay. So, like, as a kid, I loved acting and I was in a little theater troupe. Like, I was a little kid. And I always loved it, but I'm not an actor now. But what I have found or what I have discovered in my business, actually both of my businesses, is I love doing video and I love doing Facebook Lives. And I think it's because it kind of gives me that sense of um, that sense of excitement of like being on stage or performance kind of thing. So how can you bring what, you know, what you love to do as a kid or a youth, you know, bits and pieces of that into your new business to kind of, you know, make it exciting and more fun. Cause I think there, we, I think we did a lot of kid a lot of things as kids that we, you know, just time life gets in the way and we kind of forget about them. They go on the back burner and then they kind of disappear from our lives. So why not try to bring that back in, you know, into what we're doing. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking here, I, I put down like, maybe it could have been like a physical sport or creative outlet or something like that. How can you bring that into your business now? Like if it's something physical, can you have like a physical element in your business or clearly, and Diantha, here's what we're talking about. If we have, I think as young, you know, kids, we're always very creative and that creativity either gets not drilled out of us, but life takes over and it becomes a it gets on the back burner. So being able to bring that creativity back to what we do, I think is one of the coolest things about entrepreneurship is, you know, we can really kind of explore the creative side that has probably been dormant in a lot of us for a long time, a long time. I'm just looking at here uh, some comments. All right. Anne says, Obviously, we have passions beyond our training that causes us to want to have a business. That's where your encouragement and expertise is necessary. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the good news is, Anne, <laughs> the good news is you can make a business today out of just about anything. So if you can dream it, you can do it. I mean, I'm serious. There are some crazy businesses out there that you'd be like, is that even possible? And yes, it's possible. It is totally possible. So, so think about your childhood and youth. And then this kind of comes into the next one and what Diantha was talking about earlier, your passions, interests, and hobbies. So let's say that you have carried these forward. And as Diantha said, you know, how do we find our passions? Because you know what? Our passions do change in life. Absolutely. And I don't know if they change so much as maybe we do, we discover new passions and hobbies. So for example, like, uh, you know, a couple years ago or la not even a couple years ago, last year, uh, I got a kayak and took up kayaking. Like, I love it. I didn't do it as a kid. I didn't do it, but it's like a new passion or hobby for me. But I think a lot of us also have some lifelong passions and hobbies that have been just that they've been passions or hobbies or interests that we've done for so long. And we don't realize like, how expert we are in these things because we've just done them for so long that um yeah that we're really experts in them like we know a lot of stuff we know a lot of stuff about them so th we can always look to those passions and interests to potentially make a business from right all right i'm gonna take a quick break and just look at the comments here uh, let's see here yeah, Beverly says, I'll be painting and upcycling furniture for my business. Awesome. I bet, you know, that's totally pulling the creativity out. Absolutely. And Yuvelda says, use Facebook to make connections, show what you do. Uh, hoping to be able to do local events to sell. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think a lot of us, especially if we have had, I mean, if we worked in something that we weren't like totally passionate about, even if you liked it, 
like I said, that creativity has been dormant in us for, or kind of on the side burner for so long that this is an opportunity really to find the creative parts that you want to bring into your business. So like, you know, I love the videos, that kind of thing. Maybe it's the painting you love, the upcycling of furniture, whatever it is, whatever you're creative or it doesn't even have to be a creative thing. It could be like a lifelong interest. Maybe you've always loved like, researching ancestry or something. I say that because I just did one of those ancestry.com kits. I haven't gotten it back yet, but I, I spit in the tube and I'm, I'm anxious to hear where I'm from. Um, so, but it could be an interest like that. But the point is, it's probably something you've done for so long, you're really an expert. Or if you haven't done it for a long time, you got the passion, so you're doing it a lot and you're becoming the expert at it. And so there's really like this deep experience around our passions and interest that we can bring into, uh, you know, potentially building a business from that passion and whatnot. Now I have a couple of caveats, like, let me see here. Um, just looking at my notes, looking at my notes. So, uh, the easy and the easiest way to find a lot of these passions and interest and diantha this might help you where do you choose to spend your free time now i mean our our interests can definitely change over time what we were really interested in 20 years ago we may not be interested now but where do you choose to spend your free time like if you could spend your time anywhere and i think that kind of the answering those kinds of questions really gives us some clues about what you know, we might be really interested in. So there's that. So maybe it was, um, like I said, travel or cycling or researching ancestry or whatever it is. If something like has really floated your boat and gets you excited and that's where you choose to spend your free time when you have the opportunity, then that could be a clue, something to look at for sure. Now, turning... Um, Turning a hobby or passion into a business, you know, it, it definitely, uh, you know, requires some consideration as well because you may not want to turn a hobby or passion into a business because, well, then it's a business and it becomes work. And so there, you know, there's a whole set of kind of elements there to consider as well. But this is just kind of trying to get us inspired to come up with business ideas or potential business ideas. And I think one of the keys here is to not censor yourself when you're th when you're coming up with ideas is to really let the ideas flow and let the dreams come and kind of worry about the viability afterwards. We want to start thinking of ideas first, right? First ideas. So, um, so you may not want to turn like a hobby or a lifelong interest into a business because it will be work. And so it changes the, the dynamic of that interest or passion. And so you need to consider that. There's definitely that. And not every hobby is necessarily going to make a viable business. Um, but you could, for example, uh, take a hobby and um, peripherally turn it into a business. I'm just trying to think of, I needlepoint. I love to needlepoint. Can I needlepoint and make a living? No. Why? Because it takes so long to needlepoint a piece and the, the materials themselves are very expensive. So I would be starving to death or I would be needlepointing 24 hours a day, which just isn't viable. But does that mean I have to give up needlepoint as a potential business? No, I could potentially teach needlepoint online that's very scalable more students that kind of thing so i think we have to think about the viability of of it as well and hand making items is always very tricky to get into business correct or not correctly but um effectively that are going to help you reach your goals because your time is limited to 24 hours in a day and you're not going to be working 24 hours a day so hand making products is harder to scale but there are ways that you can scale, you know, by teaching, you know, group classes, teaching online, that kind of thing that allow you to stay in that hobby and scale it as a business that generates, you know, a revenue that is going to help you achieve your financial goals. So there's that. So, um, and the last one is you may just not want to mix business with pleasure either. I mean, 
whatever business you start as an entrepreneur, I think you should love, but that doesn't mean you have to take something you've always loved and turn it into a business because it definitely will change the dynamic of that thing that you're doing. Oops. So I knocked my desk. All right. I'm going to take a quick break and see what comments we have coming in. Paula says, I'm trying consignment shops with my crafts, but I don't make a lot due to the fact of the 60-40% rule. It does get my name out there. Craft shows are good for me, but in between is hard. It was a hobby turn into just a fun business. Yeah, Paula, and I think um, anybody who's crafting or creating like handmade items learns what you learn. Consignment is tricky because somebody's taking a huge cut of what you do and your time and effort uh, cost a lot, obviously. And so my suggestion would be to try to sell more directly as much as you can, say through Facebook, and cut out the middlemen, <laughs> whether it's craft shows or consignment, and do as much as you can direct, which you can do with Facebook. Let's see here. Diantha says, let's see here. I agree I've done budgeting for my family for years and offered advice and resources to my grown kids, but I never considered myself to be like a financial expert. But as I was reading a few blogs, I discovered I was pretty good. Weird. I never thought of myself as a finance person. Diantha, that is exactly what I'm talking about is we have, we've been doing things our whole lives and let's say we're 50 and beyond. So we got at least five decades behind us under our belt, right? that we are experts in, but we don't necessarily recognize ourselves as experts because we've just always done it. We've just always done it. So maybe you don't have CPA behind your name, but you are a family finance expert because you've been doing it for so long. I'm sure you've developed your own systems and ways of doing things. And there is no reason you could not do that as a business. Yes, with the caveats, you can't sell yourself as like a CPA if you're not, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a lot of money experts out there helping families and all. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you are a finance person. Let's see here. Cindy Ann says, love spending time in my lab dining room. <laughs> I love my, yeah. Hey, Phyllis, how are you? Yeah, Catherine, you could totally teach and make a living. If I, I think you're talking about handmade items creating things by hand is difficult because it's just you, your time is limited, period. But to scale it, to teach what you do, and that's what people really want to learn, absolutely, you can totally do that. Uh, let's see, Deb says, sometimes people don't want to spend money on what we have to offer. With that, uh, with what I do, everyone wants insurance to pay for it. It's very true, Deb. I mean, not everybody wants to pay, spend money on what we offer, on the other hand, and it's obviously very industry specific, um, you're obviously in more of a medical field where people are gonna want insurance to pay for it. But on the other hand, say just kind of generally speaking, one thing I think that uh, is pretty amazing today with entrepreneurship is the world is pretty much our market now. We can reach the entire world with social media. And so we're much more likely to be able to find our people who are willing to pay for what we do. And that's why I was talking earlier. There are some like really, I don't want to say weird. It's not me to judge weird, but, but like unusual businesses or businesses out there. You're kind of like, what? You can do that online? Like, that's crazy. I mean, you can teach harp, how people, how, you know, teach people how to play the harp. You can, I, I know a woman who teaches women how to make like those, um, old corsets like that they used to wear she does really really well so it don't discount anything um and we can reach the entire world so the likelihood of us reaching our ideal audience people who are willing to pay for what we are offering is much greater that doesn't mean that everything is going to make a great possible business but i totally get what you're saying absolutely let's see here Yvelda says, I'm retiring in April. That's why I'm getting my craft sewing room ready now so that I'll be stocked and ready to get started after retirement. Absolutely, Yvelda. And one of my questions is, is to, or quite, uh, suggestions is to sit down and determine what your financial goals are with your sewing and work it backwards. How much do you have to sew and sell in order to reach your financial goals? Because that's going to be one thing that says, doing this is going to reach my financial goals or 
maybe I'm better off to teach people how to sew because you can obviously teach more than one person at a time. And it is all dependent on your financial goals and starting and your time and how long it takes to make things. But absolutely, absolutely. Let's see here. And congratulations on retiring. Kathy joined. Hey, uh, let's see. Answers. I've always worked for government supported services. I have a hard time with the whole char charging money issue. Oh, we're going to be talking a lot about that. And it's a money mindset thing. It is. I had it. Everybody had it. Everybody has it. It's hard. Um, the only thing I will say is many, 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 many entrepreneurs that I meet undercharge for their services to begin with. And it's a huge mistake because it's very difficult to then come back and say, oh, guess what? I'm actually worth this. So we will be talking a lot more about it. I won't go in the weeds on that tonight. But what I would say is to start looking around what similar professionals do who are in private practice and what they charge. Because when we're working for government type um, systems, you know, it, the prices are very controlled and all. So it's kind of hard to, to figure out what private practice would be. But your expertise, your time, all of those things, uh, I would say consider like what you're thinking about charging and probably double it. And I'm just saying that off the top of my head, but see what people are doing in private practice. The Avelda says, I would like to teach others to sew. Absolutely. Teaching others, I mean, it's what I do, it's what many people do, is one of the easiest ways to scale a business. So I could work, if I decided I wanted to work one-on-one -on -one coaching, that would be a very expensive product that very few people could afford. But because I'm giving so much of my time one-on-one, -on -one, I have to charge a heck of a lot more in order to reach my financial goals. When we teach, like in a setting like this, um, online, which you can teach anything online, no, anything online, sewing, language, music, I mean, you can teach anything online now, uh, or, or even in person, you obviously have the opportunity to scale it because it's obviously more people coming in. Um, Mubaraka says, I want to do YouTube from when I cook. Yeah, totally. Uh, video is huge, Mubaraka. Video is huge. And obviously being able to show people your cooking and all on a YouTube video is huge. Absolutely. And Yvelda says she's figuring out time and cost. Yes. Okay, let's see here. Uh, Deborah says, and it's about getting out of your comfort zone. For charging, Yes. It is very much about getting out of your comfort zone. But here is a thing to think about, Anne. If if you are in, say, a mental, if you say you're doing something in a mental health capacity or counseling type capacity, and you come out of the box and you're not charging a lot as a consumer, I'm not going to have any faith in you. If you have no faith in yourself to be like the expert in charge, the $300 an hour. I'm just making that up. I don't know what it is. So let's say people charge $300 an hour, typically in private practice. And then you come and say, well, I'm just going to do $75 an hour because I don't feel comfortable charging more. You know what I'm going to say? She's not confident in her ability. And so I am not either. <laughs> so you need to think about that. Pricing is very much a, a, reflect, a value reflection of how people will perceive your value. Completely. It's why like luxury brands can charge, you know, ridiculous amounts of money for like a handbag. It becomes perception. So think of that. Definitely think of that because it is it is hard, especially in more of a consulting counseling type capacity. But you have to think about the perception of the person coming to you. If you're charging a third of what other people are charging, why? You're not confident. You're not as skilled. You're not as trained. Why are you like a third of the price? So uh, I think it's about getting right in our own heads about how good we are at what we're doing, the experience we have, the expertise that you can bring to the table. Very valuable stuff. Very valuable stuff. So, okay. So I got off track. See, I get off track. I got us like all the way to Nairobi there. I'm coming back. Number one, choose the practical thing only if you love to do it, right? Number two, what are you trained to do but maybe haven't done and can draw from that? Number three, find things 
from your childhood or at least elements, things you love to do to bring into a business idea. Um, did I miss number? Oh, and then we talked about passions and hobbies and turning those into a business or yeah, parts of a business. So your passions are not even just hobbies, like passions, interests, that kind of thing. And this next one is similar to passions and hobbies, but it's one I really want to touch on. What do you excel at doing? We all have things in our lives that we totally excel at doing. Like I think Cindy Ann was just saying that she does family finance, but she never considered herself like a finance expert. And yet she is because she's done it for so long for her family that she has become an expert. I'm sure she's developed systems, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you excel at? What do you know that you excel at that you're just really good at? I mean, this is the time to brag. It's totally the time to brag. I know we're taught not to brag, but this is the time to brag. We're all really good at some things, right? I'm just trying to see what, here we go. All right. So we're all really good at things. So what do you excel at? And these could be these could be skills like you've done in other jobs or just things that you've done naturally on your own that can translate into a business or translate as part of a business. So think about those. Maybe like you're great at organizations and systems or maybe you're great at finance or whatever, like family finance and budgeting, whatever it is, do not discount those. Those skills and those like lifelong interests and you've built like a lifetime of expertise in those things. So do not discount those things at all. Another way to kind of uncover these things that you excel at, what do people always ask you to do? What do people always ask you to do? Like, uh, I think that was, it was Diantha talking about um, finance. Okay, so she's probably become like the family finance person. So, you know, little Johnny's, getting married or something, he's going to come and ask her for advice on budgeting and money, that kind of thing. What do people come to you and ask you to do? Are you, are you like the, uh, you know, official family trip planner because you're so great at organizing or great at events, whatever it is, what do people ask you to do? Like maybe, you know, Mubaraka, maybe it is, oh, let's have Mubaraka bring, you know, all the food for this party because she's so great at it. What do people ask you to do all the time or what just kind of naturally do you gravitate to because you're really good at it and because you've gravitated to it over time, you've gotten really good at it, right? So it's kind of these hidden things, but they're, and I say they're hidden because you may have been doing it for so long that you don't even realize that it's like this amazing skill or asset that you have. Um, like the family finance or cooking or whatever. If you've done it for so long and you're such an expert that it's kind of hard to recognize it as an asset because it's just kind of a part of our daily lives. We don't see it for what it is, right? So I don't want you to discount those and I want you to kind of think about those things that you do. So what are you really good at? What do you gravitate to? And what do people regularly ask you to do? They're asking you to do it because you're good at it. They're asking, I mean, that's about, they're asking you to do it because you're really good at it. So think about that. And I'm going to take a quick break here and see, let me see here. Cindy Ann says, I'd love to teach people how to make natural products. Absolutely. And be an affiliate marketer. Absolutely. And if you've been making natural products for your family, then you are the expert. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. As I'm showing how to make the products. I'll be recommending companies to various companies to purchase from. Absolutely. That's classic affiliate marketing. And if you start because you're an expert, so you have a blog, you're doing things where you're showing people how to make these products, which I would, I wouldn't give it away for free. Not all of it. You can you know, you can teach classes, you can do some free online, you build your audience. And then as you build your audience, you start recommending this particular product, that particular product, and it's an affiliate link and boom. But you, I would suggest you look at making money on both sides of that. The teaching how to make natural products, you know, how to, what to use them for and affiliate marketing. Because affiliate marketing takes a long time to build up because you have to have a, you know, a pretty substantial audience to buy these products that you're recommending, right? Vicki says, this is so good. Oh, I'm so glad, Vicki. I'm so glad. So that was number five and I only had five, but then I had a bonus one. I had a bonus one. 
And this one I think we can all relate to because we're 50 and beyond. We've all lived, you know, decades. What problems, challenges, or annoyances in life could you potentially find a solution for? Now, we all have these annoyances like, gosh, I guess if somebody could just come up with an idea to A, B, or C, you could do that, right? One example that I thought of, and this is kind of a big example, but there's a local gentleman uh, who was so, and he, he is a younger guy, he was always stuck in like the school pickup line. I, get, I don't have children, but like when you pick kids up from school and you're sitting in that huge line of cars and it's just like a nightmare and there's like traffic jams, he developed an app, like a technical app for this. And it has like been like this huge problem solver. Like, so that's what I'm talking about. Like something that happens in your day-to-day -day life over and over that is just like such a pita, like a total pain in the ass. You're like, somebody's got to fix this. Somebody's got to find a way to fix this. It could be you. I mean, that is a business. That's kind of like the ultimate business idea right there, like solving something like that. So think about that as well, like just everyday things in your life. And it, and it doesn't have to be something drastic, like a big technology app. It could be something simple, like maybe you... Uh, Family finances, maybe you develop like this really great budget tracker on a Google sheet or something that is going to be super helpful and it doesn't have to be this big complicated Quicken turbo tax software thing, uh, which I have on my mind, by the way, because I have to meet my accountant next week. But I'm just saying it doesn't have to be like some big thing. It could be a simple solution to something that you have the solution and you know there's a problem out there because it's just been a total like annoyance or whatever. Don't discount those things either. That could totally become a business idea. It could totally become a business idea. All right, look in here. It answers my, the list is endless. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And that's one thing, you know, that's probably a whole nother conversation is it's also possible to get too many business ideas because we, we, we are multi-passionate. We have a lot of interest. We have a lot of experience. So there is that, that challenge as well. Um, and I, I've talked about that in blog posts and videos in the past. So there is that. So, all right. So where do you think your great business idea is going to come from? Com give me a comment. Do you think it's going to come from something you're already doing? Something that you're just passionate about and interest? Something that you just totally excel at and you're ready to run with? Where do you think your business idea is going to come from? I'm going to let you comment here. All right. And while you're commenting, I will say, before we go, I'm wrapping this up. I'm trying to keep these under, and I always try to keep these under 30 minutes, which never happens. So we're going to keep it under 60 minutes tonight, 60 minutes. Um, let me know any other topics that you want me to cover on these Facebook Lives. I do have a lot of topics. So you saw the next few coming up. The next one is, next week is how to validate a business idea even if you already have a business. And this is super important because a business idea is one thing. Knowing we can sell it is a whole nother ball game. So we need to validate the business idea. And there's a lot of ways to do that. So we're going to talk about that next Monday. And then the next one after that is, my memory is going to fail me. Let me look. Let me look. It's here. I got it here. The next one is... Boom. Oh, oh, the next one is good. Okay, the next one. So next week is about validating your business idea. And then the next one, this one might be good for you, Anne, because you were talking about um, how much do you charge? You don't want to charge too much. We're going to talk about selling and how we all have to become salespeople if we're going to be in business. But it doesn't have to be uh, icky sales. It doesn't have to be used car salesman sales. In fact, quite the opposite, but we're going to, I'm going to do a whole thing on selling. Uh, that's in two weeks. So next week is validating a business idea. Two weeks is how to sell without being icky. And it's really a whole mindset shift. So those are, that's upcoming, but I would also love to hear from you. If you have other topics that you want me to cover in this Facebook live series, 
by all means, just private message me, email me, put a comment here. I will totally get it. I promise. Let's see. I'm going to look at the comments. Um, uh, my passion. Yvelda says you're starting with um, events and a Facebook group. Uh, here's what I would say, Yvelda. Get a Facebook business page first before you get a group. You want a Facebook business page first and foremost because it is the only place from which you can promote. So a group should be secondary. So you want to start a Facebook business page, call it something super clear over clever like Yvelda's sewing and crafts. Don't have to be clever. In fact, you don't want to be clever. And this is a do as I say, not as I did. Because when people are scrolling through Facebook, Yvelda, they need to know exactly what your page does or they're going to keep scrolling because they don't know it's for them. But start your Facebook business page first. Start posting there. You could do videos there, etc. And then when you get engagement, you can actually run ads or boost. Like say, the, say you do a great video on sewing or something uh, and you get engagement, you can run ads to that video which is exactly why you are on my Facebook business page right now. And I do this Facebook live on my business page. What I will do is I'll let this video run this Facebook live, the replay, I'll let it run for 24 to 48 hours and kind of rack up quote organic reach. You know, you, you all have seen it, but people will continue to watch it in the replay. And then I will also take it and run and add to it to attract more audience. But you could only do that from a page. So if you're starting your business, start with a page first. All right. That was a little sidetrack for you, Velda, there. Uh, let's see here. Let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, uh, uh. Let's see. Sabrina says an interest connected to a pain point. Absolutely. Any business we have or start that's going to be successful has to be connected to a need or a pain point. Uh, even if it's art or you, I always say, I always give the example, like, I just want to sell t-shirts like with happy sayings on them. There's not a pain point. No, it's not a pain point, but it's a need or desire for happiness. And so that's why people would wear your product. So you need to kind of get to the why. Absolutely. Uh, Let's see. Diantha says, but uh, business ideas are things I know and have done for years. Good. That's good, at least. So that's where yours are going to come from. Okay. Great. I will be here. Good. Next week. Awesome. Hey, Michelle, how are you? Uh, I need the third one, too. Okay. Yes, Yuvelda. Okay for the business page. Yes. And I do, if you, Yuvelda, if you go on this Scrappy Frontier with Colleen Kohanek, business page on the left hand side if you click on the videos tab you'll see a ton of videos uh, Facebook lives and recorded videos that I have done on Facebook like using Facebook for business or whatnot and of course I have a course as well Facebook for business and Facebook foundations but I have a ton of free videos um, in the left hand side click the video tab and you'll see I think there's even one how to start a Facebook page that kind of thing so there's tons of free resources there uh, let's see. Kathy says teaching online. How do you do it? The tools needed. Um, well, you do it just like this. Uh, you know, there are a lot of mediums that you can use, Kathy. Um, Facebook is free for one. You can certainly have a page and a group where you uh, teach online. If you wanted to monetize that, you would definitely want to uh, have uh, for example, a place to house like online courses. And there are many softwares out there that kind of are all in one. I use a product called Kajabi, K-A-J-A-B-I. It's kind of um, a Cadillac of softwares that does everything. It houses your website, houses your courses, does the payment processing, that kind of thing. But in essence, if you want to teach online, it's no more complicated than like creating videos like I'm doing now, you know, with talking points and uh, obviously a little bit more organized if you're teaching, you know, a specific topic. Um, so you make videos, you could make it just to an audio, you could upload just PDFs depending on what it is you want to teach online. It's um, I think it's a great way to get into business and to be able to like use our expertise to teach something. So I use, videos. So for example, I have um, two courses right now, both on Facebook. They're both housed in this Kajabi product. 
and literally I record videos, I upload those videos, and I'll have sometimes downloadable PDFs to go along with those videos to help um, teach the material. I'll have transcripts of the, the, um, the lesson, and I do live uh, co-working sessions or like live workshops through a product called Zoom. Those are recorded. People can come ask questions. So there's, it's super easy to teach online now. It's actually very easy to teach online if you have a specific topic in mind. Um, Cindy says pain points. Pain points are the thing. Um, so let's say uh, Diantha's, I keep going back to Diantha's finance and budget now. So that's a pain point. Like say I'm a new family and, uh, you know, just newly married and I need to make a budget, but I don't know how. That's my pain point. I don't know how to manage my money. I'm losing money. I'm afraid I'm losing money. I'm afraid I'm spending money in the wrong places. That becomes the pain point. Um, and things like a creative endeavor, like we were saying, it's not necessarily a pain point, as in painful, but it is definitely a desire. So we always have to remember we the thing that we do, the product or service that we do or sell is not what we're selling. We're selling the result or the outcome. So for example, I have two Facebook courses. I sell Facebook courses. But what I'm really selling is the convenience of uh, being able to see over my shoulder exactly how to do things in Facebook. So I'm teaching you how to, like step-by-step, step, the convenience, the speed of not having to figure it out for yourself, those kinds of things. So you're you're always selling the result or the outcome. You're not really selling the product or service, if that makes sense. So there was a really great question the other day. Um, there's a scrappy entrepreneur, Kelly, who's a photographer, and she had some copy that we were kind of um, brainstorming on where she talked about, you know, get your family portrait now kind of thing. And my reaction was nobody wants to buy a family portrait. Nobody wants to buy a portrait. What they want is to be able to have that picture hanging in their hallway and they want to be able to walk by it in five years and say, oh my gosh, remember that day we all wore our white shirts and, you know, the dog wouldn't cooperate. And they, so you're not selling the portrait. Nobody wants a portrait, but they want the memory. You want that picture on the wall. So the memory, nobody wants a root canal, right? Nobody, but you want the pain to be gone. So what is the outcome or result? And it doesn't have to be a pain, like as in painful. It could just be a desire or need, if that makes sense. Let me check here. All right, let's see. All right, got to go. Okay, yeah, I'm, oh, see, I'm already two minutes over. Awesome, so let me just wrap up. So tune into next week. We're talking about validating your business idea. The week after, we'll be talking about selling. So there's that. I wanted to mention that. If you want to be sure to get notified of these Facebook Lives. When we're done here, just go to the top of this Facebook business page and hit like and follow, and that way you'll be notified. And I send emails and do all that kind of stuff as well, but if you want to be notified within Facebook, hit like and follow and make sure notifications are on for this page so you will be notified when I'm live. And, and I'm just talking about this because I'm very excited because I have been working on it. Coming very soon, very soon, is the Scrappy Business Club. It's going to be a monthly membership site where we get like hands-on master classes, like step-by-step -step how to do very specific things to start your business with live coaching sessions and an ongoing community for support. So ongoing support. So tons of like just hand holding, getting your business started. That is coming. So I'm just putting that little bee in your bonnet. The Scrappy Business Club is coming. Working on it now. So with that, ladies, if there's any final questions before I hang up, I got, I ran late as I always do. I ran late. Any questions? I'm going to give it a second before I, before I hit the end live video because there's always a delay. I don't see anything coming in. Of course, if you have a question after this fact or if you're watching the replay, comment below this, this video and I get notified and it's like it's live even if you're watching the replay. All right. I don't see any questions coming in, so I'm going to say have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for your patience. I apologize again for the hour delay. 
I'm going to go deal with that delivery now as well. But I certainly appreciate it. And it was wonderful spending my Monday evening with you all. All right, ladies, have a great night. And I will see you online.